Buenos tardes. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the enormous privilege of serving as president of Hunter College, where the American dream continues to come true more than 150 years after our founding. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of us at Hunter College, Roosevelt House, and El Centro to today's critically important conversation on the future of Puerto Rico. As many of you know, Centro is the country's foremost research institute library and archive dedicated entirely to Puerto Rican scholarship. At Hunter, we are proud to be the home of and the great supporter of this vital link to, the, to Puerto Rico, to Puerto Rican studies and the Puerto Rican diaspora. There is simply no more important voice for the Puerto Rican diaspora than the storied El Centro and we are so proud that we will be celebrating Centro's 50th anniversary next year. Speaking of pride, Hunter is proud to be the home of a very active and impactful LBGTQ Policy Institute at Roosevelt House and is very excited to be ending Pride Month this week by welcoming the first openly gay Afro-Latino in Congress representing New York's 15th district, Congressman Richie Torres. Let's give him a round of applause for staff. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. It's really a well, it's such an honor to welcome you back to Hunter. As a councilman, we enjoyed hosting you for a discussion of wide-ranging ish policy issues, including aging and the gay community. And we are always pleased when you came to talk to our Hunter students, including some of our young SM at Manhattan Hunters High School, where I last saw you. And today, we're pleased to have you back as congressman representing the great borough of the Bronx, and as I was explaining to the congressman, thanks to redistricting, one of the good things is I get to call the congressman my own in my own district. Um, so fun fact, although the congressman has always been an advocate of policy to support healthy aging, when Congressman Torres won his council seat almost a decade ago, he became the youngest elected official in New York City history. Since then, he's been an inspiration to new and diverse generation of future leaders, including Hunter students seeking to make a difference by setting policy at Roosevelt House. In only his first term in, congressman, Congress, in Congress, Congressman Torres has already made a great mark, sponsoring legislation on environmental justice, mental health and addiction services, funding affordable housing, and of course, casting key votes on infrastructure and the Build Back Better plan. Not surprisingly, Congressman Torres immediately became a chair of the Congressional LGBTQ plus caucus. So if it turns out to be true, which we kind of pray that it's not, and we're concerned now about marriage equality and even the private lives of consenting adults because of the crisis in the court, we know that Congressman Torres will be on the front lines fighting for equal rights and equal justice for all Americans. Through his barrier-breaking public service, Congressman Torres demonstrates clearly the power of our hunter motto, mihi cora futuri, the care of the future is mine. To speak with the congressman today, we are so pleased to welcome another maker of history, or history, the award-winning scholar, hunter faculty member, and the first Latina to become director of Centro in its nearly 50-year existence, Dr. Yaramar Bonilla. We could not be more excited to have Yaramar at the helm of such an important part of Hunter College. By advancing Centro's mission of supporting scholarly engagement on issues vital to Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican diaspora, her infectious energy, vision, and commitment has already made its mark in El Centro, and we know that the center is in remarkably amazing hands. In addition to directing Centro, Dr. Bonilla teaches in Hunter's extraordinary department of Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino studies, and is a go-to commentator on national television, national radio, and in print, establishing her as a leading voice both on the current status of Puerto Rico and in its long, complicated history to the continental U.S. Dr. Bonilla's recent book, After the Storm, which focuses after aftershocks of disaster, Puerto Rico before and after the storm, which focused not just on the traumatic and immediate impact of Hurricane Maria, but also on the deeper wounds endured throughout the island's history, was nothing short of groundbreaking. Today's conversation between these two leaders picks up on those same themes by considering the essential question of Puerto Rican sovereignty and self-determination. In particular, our esteemed guests will discuss the Trust for Puerto Rico Act, 
Congressman Torres's transformational legislative initiative to bring an end to the Puerto Rican Financial Oversight and Management Board, com commonly known as La Junta. Roosevelt House provides an ideal setting for this important conversation. It was just four years before Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt moved into this home, a wedding gift from Franklin's mother, that Franklin made his first visit to the island of Puerto Rico in 1904. 30 years later, in the early days of the New Deal, FDR returned to Puerto Rico in 1934, this time accompanied by Eleanor. Franklin called it a wonderful island with a splendid spirit, and Eleanor wrote affectionately about Puerto Rico in her column for the Ladies Home Journal. Inspired by the progress that had been made since his first visit 30 years earlier, FDR com committed to bringing the benefits of the New Deal, including better jobs, housing, education, and health to the island. He was determined, he said, to quote, solving the problems here in the island just as quickly as we shall solve them in the continental part of the US. A decade later, FDR began pushing for the advancement of Puerto Rico's self-governance. In an impassioned letter to Congress dated 1943, he proposed a law granting the people of the island the right to elect their own governor, and quote, to redefine the functions and powers of the federal government and the government of Puerto Rico, respectively. As FDR put it in his typically forceful language, quote, Puerto Ricans of all political parties, however divergent their views as to the political future of the islands, are united in asking for the right to elect their own governor. I believe they are entitled to it. There is no question, he elaborated, of Puerto Ricans' ability now to administer their own internal affairs and to assume the attendant responsibility. Congress, he said, should consider it as a matter of right and justice for Puerto Ricans. While Congress did eventually pass Roosevelt's proposal, Puerto Rican self-government still clearly remains an unresolved and critical matter, quote, of right and justice. This work is woefully unfinished. So to discuss this woefully unfinished work, the potential dissolution of the Oversight Board today, and what it would mean to return control over Puerto Rico's future to its people, we could not be more pleased to bring together these two great minds, these two great leaders. At the end of the program, we ask our in-person and our Zoom guests to please have your questions ready. As the director of Roosevelt House Public Policy Program, Dr. Basil Smeichel will join us to facilitate the audience Q&A. Basil has just completed his first year as the director of our academic programs in public policy at the House, and we are so delighted to have him here with us for this event. Usually, Basil, you're on the other end of Q&A with your frequent appearances on television, so it will be good for you to have, be directing your questions today. With that, I just want to say, uh, Congressman Mayor and Dr. Bonilla, we're just so grateful for your focus on this incredibly important issue and for your being with us today and commit to the resources of Hunter and Roosevelt House to continue this incredibly important conversation to New Yorkers and to Puerto Ricans here and, and on the island. So thank you, Dr. Bonilla and Congressman Torres. Please join us. Thank you, President Rupp, for those thoughtful opening remarks. Um, thank you, Congressman Torres, for being here. We're so excited um, to have you here and so grateful ah, for your time and your generosity of spirit. Uh, before we begin, I just want to note there's a lot going on in the world. There is a lot going on in our country. Uh, and we're so grateful in the midst of all of that to have time to talk about something that doesn't get enough airtime, right? So we really want to uh, use this occasion to keep the conversation focused on an issue that has not been talked about enough that is so urgent um, for Puerto Rico. Um, and we do, ha we are short on time, and I'm sure we're uh, full on questions, so please note you have index cards to write your questions, and uh, Zoom viewers can put them in the Q&A box so that we can collect them and, and group them. Um, so to begin, so we are here to discuss a very important piece of legislation uh, that you have introduced in the House of Representatives to abolish La Junta. So, so for those who don't know what La Junta is, uh, let me just say that it is a non-elected body appointed, hand-picked in Washington of uh, seven members, of which none have to be Puerto Rican, one has to live in Puerto Rico, 
Uh, and they were app they're appointed without confirmation hearings because of Puerto Rico's territorial status, and they're charged with overseeing Puerto Rico's governmental finances. Is, is there, would you agree with that description? Is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, that's, how that, that's how it exists on paper, but the reality is even worse. So, so tell us a little bit about the reality and about what motivated you uh, to work on this piece of legislation, especially as a freshman congressman. Why was this so central on your agenda? Like I, I have well, first, it's an honor to be here with President Rapp and, uh, and to have you as a constituent. Uh, so I'm looking forward to representing you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, you know, for me, La Junta is an abomination. Uh, it, it is an unprecedented assault on the self-governance and self-determination of Puerto Rico. And it is actually relevant to the times we live in. You know, we're in the process of holding January 6 hearings aimed at defending democracy. Uh, a powerful case could be made that nowhere, there's no place in America where democracy is more endangered uh, than Puerto Rico. You know, I, I would argue the colonization of Puerto Rico, the disenfranchisement of more than three million American citizens on the island, is a deep rot at the core of our democracy. You know, how can we claim to be democratic when we deny equal representation to millions of American citizens on the island? And how can we claim to be democratic when we subvert the popularly elected government of Puerto Rico in favor of a financial control board whose members are neither representative of nor accountable to the people? Right? This is unprecedented. And you know, it's, it's known as the Financial Oversight Management Board, but it's gone beyond oversight. The Financial Oversight Management Board is actively micromanaging the government of Puerto Rico. Right? Just like the Supreme Court is increasingly tying the hands of, of our government, um, the, the Financial Control Board is doing the same harm to the government of Puerto Rico. And I'll give two quick examples because I recently got a call from, from the governor about this, Berluisi. Um, the governor and the legislature negotiated a bill known as HB 1244, right, which would restore protections and benefits for private sector workers, right? It would, which were stripped away by a law known as the Labor Flexibility and Transformation Act. Uh, the Financial Control Board sent a threatening letter to the governor claiming that the law is illegal because it, quote, impairs and defeats the purposes of of the of promesa. Now, the purpose of the financial control board is to oversee government public sector finances. The bill has nothing to do with the public sector. The bill is about private sector employees and restoring benefits for private sector employees. And the financial control board has argued that well, we can weigh in on anything that can potentially affect government finances. Well, if that's your position, then there's no limit to your authority because anything could potentially affect government finances. And then in that same, and so that, that, that's an example of how the members of the Financial Control Board are substituting themselves for the duly elected officials of Puerto Rico. And then in that same letter, the, the board said, you know, the governor should let the free market determine compensation, employee compensation. Does that mean that the government of Puerto Rico cannot increase the minimum wage? Because that interferes with the free market. Does it mean that you cannot create any protection for any employees because it might in interfere with the free market? So, so the, the board is not acting on the basis of facts and evidence, it's acting on the basis of far right, free market, fundamentalist ideology. Uh, and it's, it's making a mockery of democracy on the island. And, and that's just one of many examples, right? Of, of I'll give you another example. Yes. This is actually the example that bothers me even more. Puerto Rico has the highest electricity rates in the country. Puerto Rico is fundamentally dependent on imported fossil fuels whose costs are compounded by the Jones Act. So in order to escape those high costs and transition to clean energy, Puerto Rico adopted a law, I believe it was called Puerto Rico Energy Policy Act, which set clean energy goals, 40% clean energy by 2025, I think it was 60 by 40 and, and 100 by 50. The greatest stumbling block to the implementation of Puerto Rico's clean energy law has been the Financial Control Board. The Financial Control Board has rejected 16 solar projects 
that would have brought renewable energy from 2% to 20% of Puerto Rico's electricity. Like that's, you know, it, it reminds us that the colonization of Puerto Rico is, is, an, is like an onion that one can peel a layer at a time, right? Not only is the United States subjecting Puerto Rico to the highest electricity cost because of the Jones Act, but you now have the United States through the Financial Control Board actively preventing Puerto Rico from escaping those costs and transitioning the clean energy. I mean, that to me is colonialism at its most egregious. A and the purpose of the Financial Control Board is to promote financial stability. Well, climate, r climate change is a financial risk. And by sabotaging the island's transition to clean energy, you're actually planting the seeds of financial instability in the long run, which is the opposite of what the Financial Control Board should be doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, there were a lot of people who, when the uh, Control Board was first introduced, um, some people were like, okay, great, let's have some oversight, since that was the, the, t the name of it. Uh, and they thought they would uh, bring fiscalization, right? There would be accountability. Uh, I interviewed, I'm an anthropologist, and I interviewed a woman who said, yes, they're gonna have to get big public buses to put all the corrupt politicians in there that the junta is gonna send to jail. And they, they didn't send anybody to jail. They, they have done no accountability, no fiscalization, and instead, you know, they're limiting all these initiatives. My favorite pet peeve one to bring up is that they didn't want to allow the government to uh, have tax-free holidays on buying hurricane supplies. They wanted to make sure that individuals pay, paid sales tax on the supplies they need to deal with the faltering energy grid, et cetera. So, so there's definitely, I think, you know, in the time that they've had to prove themselves, they've proven um, what they're about, right? So I think, I assume there's a lot of people that are supportive of this measure. So, so tell us, who are you partnering with on this legislation, both in Washington and in Puerto Rico? Well, as you know, the, the Puerto Ricans in Congress don't agree on everything. Uh, no but, me digas. Uh, <laughs> but that's the nature of the Puerto Rican community. Um, but every Puerto Rican member of Congress is on the bill, uh, co-leads. So uh, Nidia Velasquez and Darren Soto and Alexandro Ocasio-Cortez. We have the support of the committee chair of natural resources. Uh, it's bipartisan. We have the support of Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, who's the resident commissioner from Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and I've had conversations with Speaker Pelosi and, and she is receptive to expediting the abolition. And I just probably should clarify what it actually does. So the, the Trust Act would, would not immediately, but it would expedite the elimination of the Financial Control Board. It would terminate the Financial Control Board 90 days after the certification of two balanced budgets, reducing the required number of balanced budgets from four to two. And one of those budgets could actually happen before the enactment of the law. So if the Trust Act, trust is territorial reliefs under Sustainable Transition Act, um, if the trust becomes law, it would terminate the Financial Control Board either in late 2023 or early 2024. Is anyone against this measure? Uh, the insurrection, I mean the Republicans, but uh, um, uh, the, I mean, I, no, we're gonna, we're gonna face opposition from Republicans and unfortunately the relevant committee chair, like I'm actually confident we will get it done in the House. Um, we will hold the hearing in July, hopefully, uh, and the best case scenario, we'll get it on the floor by September in the House. The stumbling block in the Senate is the relevant committee chair. You wanna guess who the committee chair is? Who's the bane of our existence in the Senate? No, 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 Democrat. Joe Manchin. Uh, God has con constituted the universe so that Joe Manchin is uh, in charge of PROMESA in the Senate. Uh, so my, our strategy would be, if we're gonna get this done, is to include it in a larger bill so that someone like Manchin has no choice but to vote for it. Um, but that, that would be the best hope. I, I think as a standalone, it would face a complicated path. So we would have to include it in a larger bill, maybe the, the Appropriations Act that we passed toward the end of the year or maybe early next year. And who are your partners in Puerto Rico? Uh, the governor. Uh, the governor's strongly supportive, uh, the resident commissioner, uh, the speaker of the 
House of Puerto Rico, and actually the House of Representatives in Puerto Rico passed a resolution overwhelmingly supporting the Trust Act. And, and frankly, I think it's fair to say there's probably no institution that is less popular than La Junta. Uh, I, yes, but I have, yet, <laughs> I have yet to meet an elected official who says, I'm all for La Junta, you know, it's not. Yes, uh, outside of elected officials though, there is a lot of concern about elected officials in Puerto Rico, right? So this was part of why at the beginning some people were supportive of, of La Junta at a moment when they didn't know what exactly it was. Um, and I can attest to that because I did research about this interviewing people and they would support it but not know any of the details behind what it was. Uh, but in general, and, and since the implementation of La Junta, La Junta has not, not done any uh, you know, accountability. They haven't wanted to audit the debt either even though they recognize parts of it were unconstitutional. Um, but there have been a lot of FBI arrests, there's been a lot of investigations and and for a lot of people in Puerto Rico, and also the perception of Puerto Rico from the outside is also that there is a problem of, of corruption and of accountability. What do you say to that and to those, those questions and those concerns about accountability? Look, I, I, I wanna tread carefully because I, it is not my place as a member of Congress to dictate to Puerto Rico how it should govern itself. But as a general rule, there are certain practices of good governance that every government should follow, right? You know, not, you know, the federal government has the luxury of printing money, but if you do not have the luxury of printing money, if you're state or local or territorial or tribal government, you probably should have a balanced budget requirement, right? There should be caps on the bonding authority of your public authorities to avoid abuses. You should have an independently elected controller who could oversee government finances. So there are controls that can be put in place to protect against mismanagement and malfeasance uh, and that do not require the imposition of a financial control rule. And are those controls being put into place or how, how are you, what are you seeing that is coming together um, to, because absolutely everyone agrees that La Junta is unconstitutional, anti-democratic, uh, not in our best interest. I mean, the fact that they don't even have to live in Puerto Rico, you know, and suffer the consequences of their actions. Uh, but so how do we move out of that? What other um, initiatives are there to put other measures of accountability into place? Look, I, I don't, uh, I just as a matter of principle, I, I, I feel like we have to respect the self-governance of the island. And it's not the place of the United States Congress to prescribe the manner in which Puerto Rico should govern itself. The only place where we should be hands-on is on the expenditure of federal funds, right? So Puerto Rico is going to receive about $10 billion for the energy grid, um, and we have a vested interest in seeing those dollars spent efficiently and expeditiously. But I don't think we should micromanage how Puerto Rico governs itself. Uh, I, I think we can put conditions on how federal dollars are spent, but it's, it's up to the government of Puerto Rico to adopt the best practices on its own. And do you think the debt needs to be audited? By Puerto Rico. Um, I mean, obviously, we audit the expenditure. We have inspector generals who will audit, you know, the expenditure of FEMA funds or HUD funds. But when it comes to the internal practices of the Puerto Rican government, that has to come from within the island. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just don't think that you want Congress meddling in the island's business. We, we've done enough damage. <laughs> And then what about, uh, you know, Puerto Rico's debt, uh, its economic issues, they're not, you know, solely determined by Puerto Ricans. Um, a lot of folks have talked about the role of Wall Street in, in creating Puerto Rico's debt. Um, there, there is currently uh, some initiatives led by State Senator Gustavo Rivera, Assemblymember Maritza Davila, uh, this, uh, to, to curtail vulture funds. I'm trying to find the name of their, uh, of their initiative, but they've also been trying to uh, make sure that people don't benefit, outsiders don't benefit um, from Puerto Rico's indebtedness. How does your initiative relate to that? Well, there's no question that Wall Street has preyed upon Puerto Rico, but, but that's the symptom. The disease is colonialism, like the colonial second class status of Puerto Rico has left it wide open to exploitation. Um, you know, it has become a tax haven for the, the wealthiest interest. Um, it's an ideal tax haven because it has some of the lowest labor costs 
and the lowest tax rates. And so it's, it, but I, I see that as a as symptomatic of a larger problem, which is the colonial status of, of Puerto Rico, which has to be resolved. So for me, the systemic solution lies in resolving the status debate. Do you think the nature of Puerto Rico as a tax haven needs to be dealt with first? Um, the, look, I, 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 I mean, I, on, on, I have a clear position on status. Um, I'm not clear how you could resolve the tax issues without status. Um, like I'm not clear, because you, you, you know, if, if Puerto Rico decides to become an independent country, you cannot impose a federal tax, right? So, so I think ultimately questions of taxation will depend on the underlying status. Um, and, and I have, you know, I have a clear position on that issue. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good answer. And so, so tell us, how does this initiative relate to Puerto Rico's decolonization and, and your thoughts about that? Look, I think it will end the most egregious form of colonization, which is La Junta. But La Junta is only the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, so even without La Junta, t Puerto Rico will remain a territory. It will remain, uh, you know, a wise person once said, if you don't have a seat at the table, then you're probably on the menu. And and, and Puerto Rico's on the menu. Uh, and it ought to have a seat at the table. Now, I, I and I know there's strong opinions about status, but I, I take the view that uh, statehood represents a, a seat at the table because it would mean more resources and more representation. It would mean Puerto Rico would have two US senators and multiple members of the House and billions of dollars in new funding for programs like Social Security and Medicare. Uh, in my view, Puerto Rico will never get its fair share of federal funding unless and until it gets its fair share of federal representation. And can you st say a little bit more about that? I know you're born and raised in the Bronx. How did you come to the position that you have about Puerto Rico's colonial status? Um, it was just mostly through study. I, I'll be honest with you, when I was in the council, I never had to grapple with the issue of status. Um, it was when I became a congressman and I succeeded, um, you know, the legendary Jose Serrano. And I feel like Jose Serrano and Nidia Velasquez, even though the two of them have differences of opinion, have been the greatest champions of Puerto Rico in the history of the United States Congress. And I felt like as a young member, as a young Puerto Rican, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And I represent the South Bronx, which has one of the largest concentrations of Puerto Ricans. And I feel like even though I represent the South Bronx, I have an obligation um, to look out for the island, to, to represent the island. There's a sense in which, uh, you know, I, the, the, the Bronx is just a natural partner with the island of Puerto Rico. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be moving to uh, Q&A, so I hope you've written down your questions or put them in the Zoom box. Um, but uh, I, I agree that it's so true that, you know, Puerto Ricans don't have, you know, on the island, they don't have elected representatives in Washington representing, is it the most Puerto Rican district in, in the U.S.? Are the last available right uh, now? Well, not the new one, but, uh -huh. um, which is another tragedy, but, the spe but that's a, it's either myself or Darren Soto. So unfortunately, Puerto Ricans are moving to Florida. That's true, that's true, representative yeah. of that, that broader move. Do we have some questions ready? Two ready. Uh, the first one is uh, in need of a stronger prescription. Um, how how can con constituents, academics, advocates help you in this fight um, to support to support trust? Um, re reach out to your elected officials. Um, you know, the most powerful legislator in the country is in our home state, Chuck Schumer. Um, you know, and I love Chuck, and communicate to Chuck the moral urgency of abolishing La Junta and supporting Puerto Rico. Um, there's just no, you know, it's one thing for me to tell him or Nidia to tell him, but when you hear directly from the grassroots, it's far more powerful. I mean, elected officials care what their constituents think, um, and if the Puerto Rican community is mobilized around the issue, it will have an impact. And Chuck is responsive. Um, 
quickly, and I just want to make sure that we get a number of questions in. Uh, another question, with the, even with the elimination of the Fiscal Control Board, will its policies remain in place, particularly with respect to uh, worker or, or, or lack thereof of worker protections and so on? So how much of those policies would stay in place, if any? No, I think it relates to the example I cited earlier, is, is once the Financial Control Board is gone, uh, then self-governance in Puerto Rico has been restored. The government of Puerto Rico will have the, th the authority to enact pro-labor policies to restore the benefits of both public sector and private sector employees. Right now, the greatest stumbling block to labor and clean energy is the financial control board. So once it's gone, you're gonna have self-governance restored. Although, of course, there are some austerity measures, closure of schools, other things that won't be easily reversed, right? But I think the problem is, you know, if, if there has to be a board, and I don't think there should be a board, I, I would have taken the approaches, like I would just say, I would say to the government of Puerto Rico, you have to balance your budget. I'm not gonna prescribe how you do it, but here's the performance goal that you have to meet. But that's not, they're micromanaging. They're saying, they're like actively, even when Puerto Rico produces a balanced budget, they will actually modify the budget significantly in the most minute detail. And it's, it's humiliating. You're subjecting the people of the island, the government, to collective humiliation. That, that nowhere and else this is, in the United States. This is States happening is nowhere else in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Nowhere else in the United States. The Puerto Rico, no. We have um, one question in the back. Is this from Zoom? Yes, this is a question from Zoom. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, Congressman, what is your reaction to the recent McKinsey's disclosure, which shows that while they were offering advice to the board, they were pushing government contracts for their clients, including Quanta Services and New Fortress? I think it, it exposes the lie that the board is gonna bring more transparency and accountability. I mean, the board, when you, when you centralize so much power and so few people who are unelected and unaccountable, what will ultimately follow is corruption, more corruption, not less. Like, like I, I, don't, I, don't, I never understood the notion that replacing a duly elected government with an unelected board, how that would lead to less corruption. <laughs> I actually think it leads to more corruption because there is zero accountability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, like the board is actively micromanaging the government of Puerto Rico, but no one's actually overseeing the oversight board. And there weren't even hearings uh, to see if they had any conflicts no. of interest. Because Puerto Rico is a yeah. territory, none of that was necessary. So there's, there's certainly some things that are only ha are only happening because of Puerto Rico's colonial condition, th that this board can operate in the way that it can. But it is worth saying that you know this is not the only place where there is an emergency board. Uh, and, and but uh, people in Michigan, for example, have sued because they have found that disproportionately the populations that get put under emergency supervision are people of color, right? And so that's how you get the the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, et cetera, is under these kinds of emergency austerity measures. Um, I just always have to kind of but, uh, but say, the, uh, say that, 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 that Puerto Rico's colonial condition is part of broader policy. Well, except, I mean, obviously I oppose the emergency manager in Michigan, right? But there it was the state that imposed it, yeah. right? So the, 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 the residents of Flint, Michigan and elsewhere had the ability mm -hmm. to, 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 to oh, vote that pe yeah. those people out of office, yeah. whereas the people on the island have no voting power, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have no recourse. Like uh, to me, there's just, P Puerto Rico is, is, I mean, take one more example is the energy grid. You know, one would think in the 21st century, every place in America, in the wealthiest country in the world, would have access to reliable electricity. But not so in Puerto Rico, right? The reality is much darker in Puerto Rico, which has seen a never-ending cycle of massive power failures. The, the power grid is in a state of crisis um, because of a series of hurricanes dating back to September 2017 and earthquakes dating back to December 2019. And I know you know these facts, but I think it's worth recounting. Mm -hmm. I mean, first came Hurricane Irma in early September, which left 1.2 million residents without electricity. 
Next came Hurricane Maria, which left residents without electricity up to 10 months, like the longest running blackout in the history of the United States. Uh, and then you had the earthquakes, a 6.5 magnitude earthquake that decimated Costa Sur, which I think accounted for 25% of Puerto Rico's electricity. So for me, there's nothing more critical to the recovery of the island than restoring the power grid. And I was just informed by Victor Martinez as my point person on Puerto Rico, and, and he just informed me that the Financial Control Board now expects the government of Puerto Rico that before you can even spend a dollar, you have to submit massive amounts of paperwork. What sense does that make? Like if it's an emergency, we have to spend the money. We don't have time to go through layers and layers of paperwork, right? If, if my house is on fire, I don't give a damn about paperwork. I wanna get the money spent. And we're moving into a fifth year anniversary of Hurricane Maria in September. Um, I'm moving into what's already been predicted to be a very active hurricane season, and the grid is still not not repaired, not where it should be, and we haven't moved to renewables the way we have to. So hopefully this first piece of legislation will be the first of many causes that, that we will see you active on in relation to Puerto Rico, I hope. Yes. Do we have any other final questions? We'll just do two, one uh, very quick question. Could you, what were the circumstances, you may have answered this already, but um, very quickly, what were the circumstances that brought all of this on in the first place, this central board? And status aside, how do we all sort of keep this from happening again, being reestablished? I don't think there's a status aside. I mean, if, if it, it, Puerto Rico is a second class, has second class status. It suffers from inequality with respect to bankruptcy, it has no ability to access a bankruptcy code, which is what necessitated PROMESA in the first place. Mm. Uh, it has inequality with respect to federal programs like SSI and Medicare. Uh, it has inequality with respect to representation and resources. So uh, as long as those inequalities persist, Puerto Rico is at risk mm -hmm. of facing a repeat of history. So we have to resolve the question of status. There's no escaping it. It's the root cause of Puerto Rico's plight. Uh, I do not think, I mean, yes, there are challenge, governmental challenges in Puerto Rico, but there are governmental challenges everywhere. But I do not think the prime cause of Puerto Rico's distress is internal corruption. I think it's colonialism. Thank you. Thank you. So there were some status bill, a couple of status bills and a compromise bill or a consensus bill, however you want to call it. They don't seem to have been taken up this year. Well, what do you support in terms of pr procedures for moving out of Puerto Rico's colonial status? Look, I, I, I mean, I have a personal preference for statehood, but I will support whatever the people vote for. So if the people vote for independence, I will legislate independence. If the people vote for statehood, I will legislate statehood. Um, I mean, I have a personal preference, but ultimately Congress ought to defer to the people on the island. Um, and for me, self-determination means allowing the people not only to decide what to decide, but how to decide. It. You know, if the people choose to express their will through a plebiscite, who are we to second guess them? Who are we to think that we know what's best for them? So. Uh, I, I, I feel like we should defer to the people of the island and, and be careful not to micromanage. Um, um, it's up to the people on the island to determine their own fate. It's their country. So the, the mechanisms for self-determination shouldn't come from the empire? I don't think so. I think uh, self-determination is about substance and process, and the people on the island should dictate the process. If the people on the island prefer a convention, then I'm all for it because as long as the people, not Congress, is deciding what that process should be. So that's my view. Well, okay, I want to, uh, well, one more, question one more question from your constituent. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're thinking in terms, how can we help you in terms of this? I think this is an issue that needs to be for widespread, for widespread discussion. I think the younger population needs to be brought in. I think the Puerto Rican community needs to be brought to the support really educated on the options. How can we help you in terms of the 
just keep highlighting the issue because I feel like the plight of Puerto Rico is often erased. You know, we're living in a moment of racial enlightenment, heightened racial consciousness. You know, and yet we often speak about systemic racism without ever mentioning Puerto Rico. You know, the Democratic Party, my party, we're, we're adamantly against voter suppression, but we never mention Puerto Rico. Mm. Right, we, we, we mention poverty, but we rarely mention, I mean, what is, it's a disgrace what is happening to Puerto Rico. And we have the tools to address the humanitarian crisis that we have inflicted on the island, but what is lacking is the political will. So the more consciousness that we can raise about the genuine suffering of the Puerto Rican people, the better. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Well, thanks everyone for coming and thank you so much, Congressman, for everything that you're doing and for making time to come talk to us about it. We really appreciate it. All right, thank you.